Please be seated. I want to speak to you today about the, the epistle. The epistle makes a reference to Melchizedek. How many of you have heard of Melchizedek? A few of you. And if, any of you know who he is? So it says in the scripture that he's the king of Salem. And the church has always seen him as kind of an unusual, perhaps even mystical figure, maybe an ahistorical figure. In other words, was there a king of Salem or was it somehow a manifestation of the later incarnate Lord? A manifestation of the word of God, but in a prefigurement of his incarnation. You say, well, is that even possible? Well, that's one of those things when you first learn about it, you scratch your head and you start to experience vertigo because you don't know what side is up and what side is down. And you think, but then you remember that this is the God who created the heavens and the earth and all things in it. And he's not bound by time and he's not bound by space. He's not limited in any way. So why would the church think this, first of all? Well, Melchizedek, I don't know the meaning of the word Melchizedek, but Salem, of course, is the word for peace. Sometimes we translate, hear it as shalom. Uh, the reason that the word Salem and shalom can be the same, by the way, uh, is because the Hebrew language doesn't have vowels. When they write their language, they only use consonants. So those who go to read it years later uh, don't know how the person who wrote it intended it to be said. So they insert vowels, and uh, so that's why there's sometimes a disagreement between the way we say things now and the way we say, say things other times. Uh, but anyway, Salem and Shalom are the same word. So he's the king of peace, this king. And he has come to Abraham after Abraham has just won a military victory. <laughs> Not that Abraham was a military type person. He liked to be just a pastoral person. But his nephew, Lot, had been robbed. Uh, forces came against him and they stole all of his, his uh, animals and all of his slaves and so forth. And uh, these many kings, they took his, his things away. And so he went and complained to his, his uh, uncle. And his uncle put together an armed force and they went and they attacked these other kings and defeated them. And in their defeat, they had to bring some kind of gift back. Of course, they had to return all that they had taken. They had to give even more than that. So a lot was very thankful, I'm sure. But Abraham, uh, and, I'm sorry, so then Melchizedek comes and he has to offer his tithe to Abraham. What does Melchizedek bring? He brings bread and wine. This is in Genesis chapter 14, if you want to go back and read it. And then this Melchizedek says these words, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And you can hear, if you, if you allow yourself, the words of Christ speaking to Abraham and blessing him. And Abraham was blessed. So what is this strange story? It could be, again, as the church interprets it, it could be a prefigurement of the mystery of the Eucharist. After this battle, after the peace has come, a sacrifice is made, a gift is given to Abraham by the king of Salem. And what is that gift? What is that sacrifice? Bread and wine. Every liturgy, you and I come here together to offer a sacrifice of bread and wine. It's the most unusual of sacrifices. If you read all of the ancient literature and of sacrifices old and, and new, and even there's some religions that continue to offer sacrifices, they've always involved blood. They always involve blood. But the Christian sacrifice is of bread and wine. 
And that sacrifice is meant to be an expression of our interaction with God. Saint uh, Nicholas Cavasilas, he asked the question, why bread? Why wine? Why not wheat? Why not grapes? Why is it that the food for the Eucharist is bread and wine? Of course, apart from this reference to Genesis, why is it bread and wine? Well, St. Nicholas Cavasilas explains it. Because in order to make bread, you take grain, you have to crush it, you have to sift out the chaff, you have to add water and salt and yeast, and you have to knead it, and you have to make it into a loaf, and then you have to bake it. So there's human effort involved in making good bread that people are willing to eat. There's a tremendous amount of human effort in, involved. Even today, where you go to the store and buy the flour, and you don't have to worry that you might find stones in it or something else that would hurt you, still it is an effort to make bread. Just ask someone who makes bread and how much effort they put into kneading it. And then comes the wine. There's the crushing of the grapes. And again, if you've ever seen that done, you, you, if there are ways to do it now with modern machines, but in Greece still there are people who trample the grapes the old-fashioned way with their feet. And there's a, uh, an, an effort to make those grapes into liquid and pulp. And then to add in some kind of a yeast that's going to ferment the liquid and make it into wine. So it, again, human effort is involved. And those, those things then are what is symbolically offered. Our human effort to take what God has given us and make it edible. In other words, all of us are surrounded by the beauties of nature and the beauties of this earth. What are we going to do to make it so that it is at the service of the human, that he can use it in a way that is going to edify him and build him up and help him to survive? If you happen to cut down trees, you hope perhaps that some of those trees will become houses or used as a form to shape a wall or maybe made into furniture. And you might even have some of your wood that you cut down that becomes paper and makes a beautiful book, perhaps a Bible. And you think to yourself, I did that. I helped with that process. I cut down the tree. But there are many other things that we do in our lives that take the natural world and transfigure it through our effort and through our labor. And then we offer it back, hopefully first to God and then to humanity. I know I've spoken to you before about the Orthodox Christian tradition, that when we want to, let's say we buy a new car, we're supposed to take that car, its first trip should be to the church. And the same thing with new clothes. It used to be a very common tradition, not so much anymore. The first place you wore the new clothes was to the church. And you, in a way, consecrated them to God so that everything that you have and everything that you own is given to God or buy a new home and you invite the priest to bless it so that it's consecrated to God. You put an icon in it after you buy it and you put it in a prominent place to consecrate it to God so that everything that you have and everything that you own is referenced back to God the Creator. And that's what's symbolized by the bread and the wine that we eat at the Eucharist. So Melchizedek becomes then a symbol of God's promise to Abraham and God's promise to us. Because through that bread and wine, we do receive mystically the very blood and body of Christ to be for us our sustenance. We have offered bread and wine, but God in receiving it transfigures it and makes it something fit to our deepest needs, not only the needs of the stomach, but the needs of our soul. And I say this sermon to you because I want to encourage you. We are now in the holy period of Lent. I want you to take communion as often as you can. 
Sometimes we see people taking communion regularly, and if we aren't used to it, we scratch our heads and say, are they fasting? As if to say, they can't be living a life worthy of communion regularly. But I'm saying to all of you, live a life so that you can take communion regularly. Do whatever fasting that you are capable of doing, but take communion as often as you can. And when the morning of the liturgy comes, and you say to yourself, well, at least if I could do another fasting, let me not eat breakfast. Even still, that's a good type of fast, except if you are sick or except if you have to take medicines and you're precluded from that. But even still, from the time you enter the church, we don't eat anything, do we? There's always some little gift that we give to God, some effort of our own will to match the will that went into making the bread, to match the will of the offering to us of God to us by Christ. So take communion, fortify yourself with it, be transfigured by it, so that we can behold together 